If you'll recall, the information processing model of memory is the most popular model for understanding how human memory works, and it's the model that we've been using to understand memory in this module of the course. The crucial feature of the information processing model is that there are different structures in the brain, such as short-term memory and long-term memory, that require that information be passed back and forth between them in order for memory to work. The information processing model of memory is consistent with a lot of the research evidence that we have available to us. For example, there's physiological evidence for two different memory stores, short-term and long-term memory. When you uh, examine the brains of monkeys or humans, for example, uh, in a, an MRI that can show you what the brain is doing uh, to see which parts of the brain are active in different tasks, you see that different parts of the brain are active during short term memory versus long-term memory tasks. Also, the fact that there can be brain damage, uh, as in Milner's syndrome, that prevents new information from being transferred into long-term storage indicates that there must be two different storage areas, short-term and long-term. Also, if you look at the types of mistakes people make in memory tasks, they tend to be different in short-term versus long-term memory tasks. If I gave you a list of words to memorize and then immediately afterwards asked you to tell me what words are on the list, when you made mistakes, most commonly you would mention a word that sounded like a word that was on the list. So the kind of mistake you make in a short-term task is acoustic. You seem to be storing things by the way they sound. However, if I came back to you after a week had passed and asked you to tell me what words were on the list you had memorized, now, when you made mistakes, you would probably come up with words that meant the same thing as words that were on the list, rather than sounded the same. Uh, so it seems like long-term memory relies more on storing things according to the, what they mean than to how they sound. There are also a lot of little laboratory curiosities that seem to fit nicely with the information processing model. There's something called the serial position effect, sometimes known as the serial order effect. If I give somebody a list of things to remember and then ask them to give that back to me, they remember the things at the beginning of the list and the things at the end of the list better than the things in the middle of the list. The things at the beginning of the list are well remembered because of something called the primacy effect, and things at the end of the list are well remembered because of something called the recency effect. The stuff in the middle, however, does not get retrieved nearly as well. And one possible explanation is that the stuff from the beginning of the list has already been stored in long-term memory and is therefore accessible. The stuff at the end of the list is still in short-term memory and is therefore accessible, but the stuff in the middle is in the process of being transferred and therefore not in a position to be easily retrieved. You can get rid of the recency effect by waiting a long time to ask someone to recall the list, uh, and at which point nothing is still in short-term memory. Also, the existence of retrograde amnesia is consistent with an information processing model. When you get a blow to the head, for example, as in an accident or in a sports injury, sometimes you lose memories for things that happened just before the accident occurred. And this is because the information that was in short-term memory at the time that the accident occurred, and it got sort of knocked out of the system before there was a chance to consolidate it into long-term memory. As convincing as all of these things are, there is other evidence that the information processing model cannot explain quite so well. And because of this, there are some researchers in the field who don't think the information processing model is necessarily the best one, and they've proposed other theories to help us understand how memory works. I'm only going to give you an example of one of these other theories, but it's one that's fairly popular, and it's something called the depths of processing approach, or sometimes called the levels of processing approach. According to the levels of processing theory, the best way to think about memory is to not think of memory as having a couple of different places. In other words, there is no meaningful distinction between short-term memory and long-term memory, and proposing that these things exist doesn't really help us understand how memory works. 
Instead, according to the depths of processing model, what really counts is what kind of processing does a word or another stimulus get when it's coming into the system. If you process it very deeply, that causes it to become well-remembered. If you process it very superficially, on the other hand, uh, you're not going to remember it very well. So, according to this model, there are no separate short-term and long-term memory structures. And it's the depth of processing that it receives when it's coming in that really matters. And deeper processing leads to better memory. Let me give you an example. This experimental example is kind of a, a generic version of an experiment that's been done many times over. Subjects show up for the experiment and they think that they're in an experiment where their task is to make judgments about words as quickly as possible. So they're usually sitting there looking at a screen where words are going to be flashed for a short period of time and their task is to hit a button, yes or no, one button for yes, one button for no, if the word fits appropriately with the question that's being asked on the screen. Now, this is actually a memory experiment, but there's only one group in the study that knows that. There is a control group that's specifically being told that they're going to see a list of words and that they should try to remember as many of them as they can because they're going to be tested for recall of those words at a later time. All of the other groups think that they're in an experiment where they're just making judgments of words. One group is just making judgments about the physical appearance of letters, and the question that they're responding to is something like the following. Is the word printed in capital letters? So all they have to do is look at the word and as quickly as possible make the judgment, yes or no, whether the word is printed in capital letters. Now think about this. They're not processing this very deeply. They don't have to be able to pronounce the word. They don't even have to know what the word means. It could be in a language that they don't speak. All they have to do is superficially attend to whether the letters are printed in capitals or not. A second group is asked, does the word rhyme with pain? So now they actually have to put the letters together and pronounce them to see what the word sounds like. This requires more cognitive work, and it should be an example of deeper processing. And the third group um, has to actually put the word in a sentence to see if it fits. So does the word fit in the following sentence? And then they're given a sentence, Bill ate the blank for lunch yesterday. And they're presented with words that they have to put in that blank in the sentence to see if it makes sense. Now they have to know what the word means, be able to pronounce it, and know if it makes sense in a sentence. This is much deeper processing. At the end of all of this, all of these groups are given a surprise recall task. They're told, okay, tell me as many of the words as you remember. Now, people typically get kind of upset about this. They say, what? I didn't know this was a memory experiment. If I knew that, I'd try to remember them. But that's the whole point. They didn't want them consciously rehearsing the words. They wanted them to make a judgment about each word and then move on to the next one without thinking about the previous one. Anyway, what they typically find in a study like this is that the people in the deep processing group, the people in the semantic processing group, actually do just as well on the memory test as the control group that intentionally tried to memorize the words. And the people who did the most superficial processing, the ones that simply made the judgment, is the word in capital letters or not, typically do the worst of all of the groups. So this is clear evidence that uh, the depth of processing might be a good way to understand how memory works. A demonstration that I often use in my class when we talk about this is to give the students a test about what are the details of a penny. Certainly my American students have seen pennies you can't even count the thousands of times in their lives. They've held a penny, looked at a penny, uh, used a penny to buy something. But most of the time, we don't study the penny. We don't make an attempt to memorize the details of the penny. And therefore, even though we've seen it over and over and over again, the depth of processing that we have given to the penny uh, is often pretty superficial. And my students are always entertained by how poorly they do 
in a task where they have to select what is the real penny out of a group of uh, fake pennies. So you might glance at this slide here and notice how hard it is for you to know for sure which one of these is actually the real, the way the real penny looks. So if this theoretical position is so good, the question might be, why don't we use this instead of the information processing model to guide our discussion of memory? Well, it turns out there are just as many problems with the depths of processing approach. Um, the effects depend sometime on how you test the memory recall. Is it free recall or queued recall? And what exactly are the levels of processing and how do we know what people are doing? So in many ways, it's, it's not quite as good as the information processing model. But I wanted you to know that there are alternatives out there and other ways of thinking about how memory works.